Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Archeria Farfisa V tutorial. This is part two of a two-part series. In part one, we had a look at some of the basic features of the organ, basically most of the controls on the front panel. In today's episode, we're gonna dive into the advanced panel, unsurprisingly accessed via the advanced button. Hope you're enjoying this series. And if you are, check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below. Fabulous way to help support my channel. So here we have our default sound accessed from the template folder, play a single note, and we already have a fairly complex sound because of the combination of tabs that are engaged. I don't particularly care what that sound is. I'm just pressing a C here, and you can see in the tuner, we're at minus three. The reason we're at minus three is these tuning controls. Each one of the 12 notes of the chromatic scale its own tuning control. And the reason for this is that fundamentally the Farfisa has 12 independent oscillators. For every note on the keyboard, for every note of the chromatic scale, you have your own tone generator. So this control here determines the fine pitch control of every C on the keyboard. If I play any C, we're gonna settle out at minus three. Let's play one, two octaves higher. If I now increase this pitch control so that it's slightly sharp, 5.6 cents, and play the same low C, now we're at plus seven, two octaves higher, plus seven as well. That's achieved via a thing called a frequency divider. Essentially the oscillator is generating a single tone, and then it uses a relatively straightforward mathematical process to divide that frequency up. Obviously every octave you jump up, the frequency doubles. And so a frequency divider is effectively able to generate the highest pitch and then simply divide it as it goes down the octaves. This was a fairly common technique for vintage tone generation before we got to the stage where uh, oscillators were capable of generating um, any pitch on a much larger range. Essentially all of the same named notes were all generated from the same oscillator. A side effect from this is that they're all in phase every single C that I press on the keyboard is basically coming from the same oscillator. And so they're all generated from the same position on the phase curve. So you never get any unison detune, watch. So I'm playing four separate Cs there and they're all absolutely locked. The tuning is absolutely stable, no unison detune at all. Curious byproduct of frequency division. What it does mean, however, is that we get to very slightly detune all of the 12 notes against each other. And that's one of the primary primary idiosyncrasies of these old vintage keyboards. Everything wasn't locked in tune. It wouldn't sound like a vintage organ if everything was tuned to zero. So by default, out of the factory, let's get back to our default preset. We have very slight offsets on all of these notes. Quite an important little feature not to be underestimated. If you want to make the sound, if you want to make the organ sound increasingly distressed, increasingly age-worn, then push the tuning of all of these notes to more dramatic. I mean, I'm really kind of stressing the point here by moving them this far. But if I, if I now play a C and E and a G, and I stretch those things way out, obviously sounds absolutely horrible. And then salt to taste to get you to the point where it's maybe not quite so egregious. That's a, a pretty age-worn organ there. Very straightforward volume, bass, and treble controls. I really don't need to explain those, do I? This is a master reverb setting. So remember in episode one, I said reverb was either on or off. Here we have our master level. So it's currently set to 15%. Let's turn the reverb on. Increase that. Much more cavernous. And then we have lots of different reverb types to choose from. We have our primary Farfisa reverb, just the one that came obviously with the original organ. But we have this whole range of um, reverbs to choose from. I'll pop up on screen the section from the manual describing what each of these um, options are. And some of them are pretty dramatic. Here's the standard reverb sound. As opposed to the H14. Very bright lovely evolving reverb sound. So have a play with those. Lots of choice to be had there. Next along, we have a toggle switch that defines the default behavior for the knee lever. Now in the last episode, we saw that if we drag the knee lever to the right, it basically springs back like a pitch bend wheel. That's because we're currently set to pitch bend mode. And in fact, the knee lever responds to the pitch bend control. Here's me moving the pitch bend wheel on my keyboard. If I toggle this switch into MIDI CC uh, mode, 
and then press the little cog button. Let's make sure you can see it. Yes, you can. So open this box to the right hand side. My head's obscuring some of this information, but not the stuff you need to see. If I click on the MIDI tab, you have this learn button. If I click learn and then select the knee lever, move my uh, modulation wheel. I've just mapped the modulation wheel to my knee lever. Now I can come out of MIDI learn mode, basically just shut the settings page down. And now as I turn the modulation wheel, you can see it sticks in place. Wherever I leave the CC wheel, it now sticks in place. So I have effectively a brand new filter control. Uh, if I turn MT boost on, I can leave that tonal setting wherever I want rather than the pitch bend and behavior where it snaps back to center. Down at the bottom gives us the ability to drive into it with aftertouch. If I press into a key, you need aftertouch on your keyboard in order to be able to do that. The toggle switch to the right of that enables us to have a wah filter instead. So let's put it in wah mode and I'm going to change presets to demonstrate this. If I switch to organ, crunchy drive, so there's my basic tone. Re-engage the wah filter because obviously the preset overrode it and put it in pitch bend mode. So now the pitch bend wheel is going to control a wah wah effect. Let's have a look at the lower range of controls in the advanced panel. Starting from the left hand side, got three controls that only affect the bass wave. So let's engage the bass manual, give myself two octaves to play with. There we go. Now these tone controls are active all of the time, but you're gonna get much greater response out of them if you turn bass sharp on. So I'll do that. Tiny bit loud. That's reasonable. So there's a low pass filter for our bass control and resonance. See this resonance spike? I'm circling it with my mouse in the, uh, in the spectrum analyzer. Then we've got multiple different bass waves to choose from. We start out with the, um, the standard original. You can see in the oscilloscope. Quite radically different sounds and each one of these is going to have a radically different effect on the tonal circuit as well. Additive and shape, the two controls at the end, are interesting. We'll get to those in a moment when we have a look at the user wave. I'll just leave them alone for now. So that's the tonal circuit for the bass control, the first three knobs. Then we have an arbitrary and totally random noise level. If you want to reintroduce uh, in the UK, it would be a 50 hertz hum. There we go. You can have your hum back. You spend your entire life trying to get rid of it, and then they give you a knob to bring it back in. Not for me, thanks. Next along, we have a voice mode, either polyphonic or paraphonic. This lets us choose two different attack variants. And in order to hear the voice modes, we need to turn the attack release envelope on. AR stands for attack release envelope, it needs to be engaged. And now we have shock horror, attack and release values for our sound. So I'm gonna come back to the voice mode in a moment, just demonstrate attack first. I've introduced some attack. So now every time I press a key, takes a while to get there. Same kind of thing for release. There it's it coming in and there's it fading out again. I'll turn the release back off and now we'll jump back to the paraphonic control. So everything you've heard so far has been polyphonic. Every key that I press has that attack release envelope. If I switch it to paraphonic mode, however, this basically puts it in a sort of legato mode so that if I press multiple keys on the keyboard, you're only ever going to get an attack envelope for the first of the played notes. So there's my attack envelope. From this point onwards, there is no more attack. So this is a nice way to introduce your chord, which has the full attack envelope, but then you can solo over the top of it. Switch back to poly mode. Next along, we have this offset knob and it looks like it's got something to do with tonal color. We have dark and bright, but when I press a note, we get 
nothing from the knob. This offset knob is connected to the user wave. So now it's time to have a look at the user wave. For everything that we've done so far, the user wave has had nothing to do. In fact, if I try to pick up these little controls, I can't move them because the user wave is currently set to off. I'm gonna pull this toggle switch down to put it in shape mode. And now these switches describe physically the shape of the wave that's gonna get generated. So this is gonna be the organ's approximation of a square wave. The Farfisa organ is never going to generate a pure square wave, but this is a reasonable approximation. If I put it on base 16, we'll get the purest tone. There we go. And that's about as good as it's gonna get. The primary feature of a square wave, which is what you can see here visually, is that you only get odd harmonics. So if we have a look in the spectrum analyzer, you're gonna get the first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth harmonic of the harmonic series. Here's the fundamental at 130 Hertz, it just disappeared off the screen, annoyingly. Uh, the second overtone is gonna be the third harmonic or 130 times three, 390. 130 times 5, 650, and so on and so on. So it's drawing a reasonable approximation of a square wave. I can now click in this user interface and draw a new shape. And the Farfisa will do its best to recreate this physical shape in the Spectrum Analyzer. And it's basically a very cool way to build user-defined tones. The other way that you can use the user wave is in additive mode. If we move this toggle switch up to additive instead, now each one of these switches represents a single harmonic. So as things stand, it's gonna generate its interpretation of a sine wave. We only have the fundamental. And actually that's really a pretty good sine wave. It's doing a very good job of that. Let's introduce some new harmonics. Oh, I accidentally flipped over to the fourth harmonic and you saw it pop up on the Spectrum Analyzer. And as you can see, it's doing a very good representation of exactly the job it's being asked to do. It's generating harmonics at exactly these frequencies, adding them all together. That's how an additive synthesizer works. Now that we've generated a reasonably complex wave, there we go. I can now start playing with offset because offset is a master low pass filter for the user wave. So at the moment with offset turned all the way to bright, we're getting all of the harmonics. As I pull this control down, I apply a low pass filter and I start throwing away those higher harmonics. Now then, do you remember when I was talking about the bass wave and I said there were a couple of controls up at the top of the bass wave knob, additive and shape, they use this user wave and it doesn't even matter if I turn off the user wave so that it looks like it's been disengaged, the base wave still has access to it. So if we put the base wave in additive mode and play a bass note, there's that complex wave shape that I defined with the user wave earlier. Switch it to shape mode. And that's the harmonic map we defined with the shape map earlier. There it is. Very cool, very advanced stuff. Obviously you didn't get any of this in the original instrument. This is our Churi just having a little bit of fun. You very often find in these advanced pages features way beyond the capacity of the time. The, the original Farfisa couldn't do any of this, but it doesn't mean to say it isn't great fun playing with it. Let's throw all of that away now. Let's get back to the crunchy drive that we played with earlier. So a large part of that crunch is coming from the lower controls. This emulates a Fender Twin amp. If I turn off the amp, we lose a lot of that tonal character. And another large part of the character is coming from this overdrive pedal. Turn overdrive off. That's the fundamental sound of the organ. There's the overdrive. There's the amp. Another nice effect you can achieve with the amp is to turn the master volume down and the primary volume, this is the preamp volume. If you turn that all the way up, and turn your master volume down a little bit to compensate, you'll basically be driving the virtual tubes inside the amplifier a little bit more, and you'll make the amplifier break up more. So if I try to get some sort of equalized volume, pull preamp down, master volume up. If 
have a much softer, a much cleaner tone with the master volume turned up. Finally, we have five effects pedals uh, at our disposal. Now the effects themselves are fixed, but the order of them is variable. So if I put the chorus first, for instance, as you can see, it's simply swapping two of the controls in the, in the link. You can't, for instance, have two choruses. You're always gonna get one of each, but you get to choose the order in which they appear. Personally, I'm a fan of one modulation effect at a time. If I've got a phaser on, I don't really like chorus and flanger on simultaneously, but knock yourself out. There's absolutely no reason why you can't. The phaser is a very nice phaser. If you turn chorus on as well, both of those modulation effects are effectively introducing delay circuits uh, into the thing. And to me, it just ends up sounding a little bit washy. There's nothing really wrong with the sound. You can hear it both chorusing and phasing simultaneously. And that'll do us for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you again. Thanks very much.